Hey guys, good to see everybody again. This here is the new Benjamin Marauder Semi-Automatic. Yes, I said that right, Semi-Auto. Today I'm going to briefly get you familiar with what it is, and then I'm gonna spend a lot of time sharing with you what it is that I've learned about it so far, which is kind of a lot. But if you are new here, this is not my main YouTube channel. This is an offshoot of the Airgun Exploration and Advancement Channel, or AEAC Home. It is over there that, weather permitting, in about two weeks, you will catch a full review of this gun. What that means to you is 50 yards, 100 yards, trigger, sound, refill, handling, and a whole lot more. What this is, is bringing you guys in on my discovery and approach after having spent about a week completely and thoroughly learning this gun inside out and sharing that information with you in great detail, okay? Also, to head y'all off at the pass and so that I don't create a whole bunch of extra work for myself, in the comments down below, no, I haven't forgotten my glasses. About two weeks ago Thursday, I got corrective LASIK eye surgery, which is literally where they take a cold laser to reshape the lens of both of your eyeballs so that you no longer need glasses. So yeah, hopefully good riddance for at least 12 to 15 years, according to the doctor, and then apparently we've got to do it again. All right. Let's get the boring stuff out of the way. The rifle is 43 inches long. It weighs 8.6 pounds by itself with the wood stock. If you go synthetic, you're going to save approximately a pound. It's 11.2 pounds scoped up with there with a magazine in it and uh, the rings on the scope. So basically shoot ready. As you see it here, it ships with one 10 round magazine. It's available in 177.22 and 25. Um, you're in the 700 or so dollar price point for synthetic, 730 or so for wood. It is all made in America. It comes with a very good owner's manual and it comes with this little like quality control shot card from Crossman. Five shot group at 10 yards, as in 30 feet. Crossman, you know I love you, but this is, this is the year 2021. And you're kind of showing your age with this because modern pre-charged pneumatics, the standard at which they are judged now, currently, for the last at least five or 10 years, is 50 and 100 yards. I don't know who this is going to make feel good, but it certainly doesn't do anything for me. All right, rant over. Um, I want to really pick this apart and dive into, as I said, with great detail, so much that I've learned, and I've also been in communication with the Crossman product manager, Philip Guadalupe, a lot throughout my learning to, to make sure that when I had questions, I was ask, asking the factory so that I'm relaying information to you that is absolutely correct. Um, it is my guess that you want to begin with this semi-automatic action, so let's, um, let's begin there. All right, so... I'm trying to think of a word I can say because YouTube doesn't like this word. So this charging handle and, um, and forward assist is based off of a, another gun that is very popular here in the United States, okay? And this basically works the same way. It's charging handle, grab it like so, you let it go, you push your forward assist, and then you are locked and loaded, right? And as fast as you can pull this trigger, Okay, you're gonna be launching lead downrange. Now the gun can be safely decocked, all right? So pull it back all of the way, let it slide forward, kind of till you feel like a little bit of a stop, grab the trigger, ease it forward, and then, um, and then you're no longer in that fire position. Also, I should mention this gun is fully regulated. And, uh, and we'll get into all that performance and shot charts and what I saw for extreme spread, standard deviation, foot pounds, enter velocity, Foot pounds of energy velocity. We'll get into all that, I promise. Okay, so Crossman spent a couple of years and hundreds of thousands of shots perfecting this mechanism. And I'm, I'm going to share with you kind of how it works so that you can kind of grasp this stuff. So in the past, there's been a couple of other semi-automatic offerings in the pre-charged pneumatic world, but the challenge has been getting them to cycle reliably and flawlessly across a bunch of different types of ammo and also with aftermarket moderators. 
Right now, the way this has been designed is if you guys can picture this, I know a lot of you know your way around a PCP, but you've basically got a hammer that smacks a valve, the valve opens, and that allows the air to flow through the gun and push the pellet or the slug out the barrel, right? The way this works is Crossman basically has captured, they're telling me one to 2% of the waste air that they have purposely designed into that valve, valve stem mechanism during the firing cycle to bring the bolt probe rearward and compress it up against a spring, all right? <clears throat> so let's recap that. Hammer strikes the valve, right? The valve opens, allows some air into the chamber, and then it closes again. I know this is a very dirty thing to be doing on YouTube, but just bear, bear with me, all right? When the valve opens and closes, there's a 1% to 2% amount of air that they have designed into those tolerances when they built that interface that actually will go flow past the valve and, and compress the bolt rearward up against that spring. All right, and then just the weight of the spring is what puts your um, put your pellet or your slug into battery. It loads it into the into the uh, into the chamber, and it is because of that design that it is not at all sensitive to anything going on up here with blowback and or that might work like a um, a gas charged normal modern firearm. It's all kind of contained within, so it makes for a lot of reliability when it comes to that cycling. Um, cycling action now and I'm going to share a story with you about reliability and and what I found but this forward assist it's also important for you to know this is not a forward assist like on how that other gun where you bash it right here and it makes make sure that that round is in uh, in battery um, it's a forward assist that it's spring-loaded when you push it and all it really does is when I do this okay and that round is cycled. Sometimes that action alone didn't properly seat the pellet into the chamber. Maybe it's uh, plus head size or whatever. Maybe the pellet's imperfect. So what you do is you just you can and you'll you'll kind of see it and feel it up against the, where this charge handle seats on the receiver. What you can do is with that first shot, it's kind of important that you pump that um, that forward assist once or twice because it adds extra preload to the spring that cycles the bolt back forward. And it makes sure that that pellet is seated in that chamber. So if in that very first round, when you cycle the charge handle, your velocity seems a little bit off, that's because your pellet wasn't seated all the way forward. And maybe the skirt of the pellet is covering up that transfer port a little bit. So it's not getting all of the air that it should get. Pushing this will solve that. Now in my experience, um, it was, I. I got probably 500 rounds through the gun. And after my first debacle, which I'll share with you in a minute, I had 100% completely flawless cycling and feeding across a ton of ammunition and with good accuracy, uh, re good repeatable accuracy. Um, but so, you know, it's just important to make sure you're kind of taking advantage of that, that uh, forward assist during that first pellet so that you don't run into a, so that you don't run into any challenges there. Um, I, I, I should probably share this. So for those of you that are used to operating that other kind of gun that uses a charge handle, we're used to just kind of grab it on this side, you know, and, and giving it like a one flip up. You really can't do that with this. Um, I mean, you kind of can, but if I, were to t if I were to take this apart, one, two, three, four bolts, and I can kind of lift the top of the receiver off a little bit, you'll see like a little, um, like a little peg that's sticking up. And this charging handle literally just loops around that that peg and you're and you're cocking the gun that way so there is some side to side movement like this and there's some up and down movement that is a that is normal but there, this is a pretty heavy deal so kids probably not very senior citizens probably not i'm in the gym all the time i exercise a lot yeah i'm an old dude at 46 but there's some there's some weight to make this work. So you're not gonna be grabbing this on one end. It's a two-sided, it's a two-sided deal. All right, come forward and I'm safely decocked and, uh, and back on safe. All right, so um, let me share this with you too real quick before we get into the magazines. So I clean with Patchworm 
2020 Concepts Patchform Bore Cleaner. It's the kit I love. Best $7.99 you'll ever spend as an air gunner. Get yourself a bottle of Ballastol too. All right. When I pull patches through here, obviously you can't access you can't access the uh, the breech because the probe has got a spring on it that's closed the breech. So how do I get in there? All right. What I did is I took a little brass adapter that came from I don't know if it came from my Dewey cleaning kits or my my cheap Amazon cleaning kits, but but I, I needed to come up with a way to get this charging handle to stay in the rearward position. All right, I'm gonna show you this. It's kind of hard to do sitting down because like I said, there's a good amount of weight right here. And I'm gonna set this between, there it is. I'm gonna set that between the receiver and the little bit of a charging handle. And now as you can see, I've got access to my breech to clean. All right, the, um, well, we'll get into the barrel in a little bit, but the moderator or the shrouds unscrews and slides right off. Um, there's probably a couple of bolts up here where you can pull out that barrel, but I didn't miss, mess with that. I just kind of did it this way. All right, so let me see actually something here. I just want to try something. All right, so that's totally decocked. I'm wondering if it'll just kind of fit in there. No, it won't. You got to give it a little bit of a pull to get that to sit in there. All right, and that's what that looks like close up. Okay. Now the other thing with this charging handle, come on, come on out of there. All right, so safety off and good, decock. So the other thing with this charging handle is about 80 shots in, when I would, it would get, it was really getting stiff on me pulling it rearward and like so, and then seating it up against the receiver. The other thing to make sure is when you charge it for that first time, that the charging handle is fully seated up against the receiver and then hit that forward assist. That way you're making sure that that first pellet is where it's supposed to be. The automatic feature will take care of it. It took care of it for me flawlessly. And I ran everything up to about 19 grains. Crossman says you can go as high as 20 or 21. I didn't fool with it and I didn't fool with that weight and I'll get into with you I'll get into why with you in a um, in a little bit all right but the reason I was experiencing that difficulty when I was pulling that charging handle back that first initial tug off the receiver and then running it forward is because there's a little plastic ball in the top of the charging in the top of the charging handle and on the bottom of the forward assist housing, there's like a little detent that that ball kind of sits in. And my ball kind of got like a little flat spot on it. Imagine a, a spherical ball with like a little wedge cut out of it. And the ball kind of tends to roll around in there a little bit. And that little wedge was locking itself perfectly up against, you know, that detent and everything else. So it, was very, it became very hard to pull out and to reseat. So long story short is I took off the charging handle. Very easy to do. One, two, three, four screws on the top of the receiver. Lift it up like maybe an eighth of an inch is all you got to do. You don't have to take anything off the gun. Lift this up off of that little peg I was telling you about that hooks to the hammer and um, and then you know just, just slide it out. And that'll give you access to this ball. I took a rubberized Dremel bit and I shaved my ball to remake it spherical. And then I lubed my ball with super grease and I lubed the detent and it's been flawless ever since. So my guess is um, that's kind of a break-in thing that's gonna be normal for the ownership experience in this gun. Not where you have to take it apart and do that, but if you get that stiffness, my guess is that'll eventually wear away as the ball kind of wears itself into a, into a, into a happy place with that detent. But I, I didn't have the patience to wait for that, and I didn't want to be struggling. It, it, it's, it was tight. I was putting probably 30, 40 pounds pulling on that sucker before I could get it to pop out. And same thing going back in, and I just, you know, that wasn't going to look good on camera, so I fixed it. And I'm telling you all about the fix. All right? So the feeding. The feeding for me, as I said, I, so I got the gun. I put about 20 shots through it. And on my 21st shot, uh, it didn't cycle properly. And I'm guessing that's because there was some sort of maybe a break-in. 
I was just using an 18 grain JSB and it didn't cycle properly. And like a moron, I was in that other charging handle gun mode where you just, you just cycle, it, you know, you just cycle to clear and cycle to clear, look, and then you go. And this doesn't work exactly like that. So what that winded up, wound up doing is taking a second pellet and putting it into battery. So now I've got a couple of them in there. And the problem is when you do that, these magazines are, 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 these magazines have been designed and this mechanism has been designed with a very, very carefully calibrated timing and sequence. All right. And if you muck up that timing, when that bolt comes back and then it comes back forward, rather than landing in the middle of the hole, if this magazine hasn't properly indexed itself, it's going to come come down and land square on one of the splines in the magazine. And after fiddling with it and mucking with it for, you know, those five or 10 shots after I smashed the first spline, I wound up smashing like three splines on the magazine. And, you know, if, if you are not a dodo head like I am, it says very clearly in the owner's manual, if you have a misfeed during the break in, which may happen, it's really important that you pull the charging handle back, yank the magazine, then let the charging handle go forward, point the gun in a safe direction, and, and, and fire it to discharge that mag, that, that pellet. Otherwise, it's just going to grab another one, and it's going to just start stacking them up in there because there is no pellet ejection when you run that charging handle rearward as there would be you know, in the guns that the, this kind of design is sort of taken from. So it was a shift in thinking and I was an autopilot and being kind of a ding dong and I mucked up the first magazine. Once I figured that out and learned the hard way, um, Crossman sent me a new magazine. Actually, they sent me more than one. Thank you guys for doing that. I asked them to, to make sure I could get through the review. This magazine, I've run 500 shots through flawlessly without one single hiccup because if ever I would have an issue, um, pull the charging handle back, yank the magazine out, let it go forward, hit that forward assist and clear it. But the funny thing is after that first one where I mucked everything up, I didn't have a single misfeed problem once ever. And I put a ton of different uh, shots through the gun. So I wanted to share that whole story with you so that you don't repeat my mistakes and you have a great ownership experience. Cause once I got past that first little hurdle and mistake, this thing has been an absolute blast. I wasn't for sure at first, because of that, but um, that was on me, and I had a really enjoyable time testing all these different pellets at 25 yards, because that's what we do here in this process, 50 and 100 on the other channel. Don't want to see no dodos in the comments saying, where's the 50 and 100? I seem to get that a lot. And, um, and anyway, okay, so let me think if there's anything else I wanted to share with you about this, uh, this charging mechanism. No. The other thing I should probably mention, um, the regulator had no problem keeping up with that rapid fire, which kind of surprised me. And it might be because I just came off of when I did the Dreamline, a 95 foot pound gun where that's moving a lot of air. You could li literally hear that regulator like a turbo just after each shot, just kind of like reload itself, you know, because that's so much power and so much air. This is not that. This is 24 foot pounds. Um, there is an external hammer spring on the back of it. You kind of have this window between 24 and 26 foot pounds. Crossman is telling me where it'll still work with this reg, which falls off, uh, which kind of falls off at around 200 or so bar. I found that in my shot charts. So be aware you have a little bit of adjustability there. Um, okay, that's probably enough on that. Let's get into the barrel. So 1772225. The barrels are made in-house by Crossman. This is a 2-2, okay? If you go to the Crossman Custom Shop on their website, you can have 177 and 2-2 in a Lothar Walther, and um, the 2-5 not because there's a supply and demand issue right now with the 2-5 Lothar Walther match grade. So at the moment, they have 177 and 2-2, but I, I don't know that you're going to need it. When I reviewed the Benjamin Marauder bolt action a couple of years back when the Gen 2 first came out, that was an in-house made Crossman barrel. That was a 50 and 100 yard accurate barrel. 
from what I've seen at 25, I suspect this will be the same, okay? Like I mentioned, the shroud just unscrews and slides right off. And then you've got access to where you can put eyes on the barrel and maybe even remove it with a bolt or two up here on the top of the receiver if you wanted to, right? The air cylinder. This is a 3000 PSI fill air, air cylinder, which makes it a good choice for those of you that are on the hand pump. If you're on a bottle or compressor, it's gonna fill it very quickly. It's 215 cc's with the regulated version, just as it is 215 cc's with the non-regulated version of this gun. Because with the regulated version, they made the air cylinder two inches longer to house the regulator, which I'm guessing lives right back in here somewhere. It's two inches long, so they gave you an extra two inches so that you wouldn't lose any of those 215 cc's. As long as we're on the topic of air, okay, using the Crossman Premier Domed, oh, this barrel has been designed around the 14.3 grain Crossman Premier Dome Pellet. It happens to do very well with a lot of others, and we'll get into that, I promise I'll share that with you. But that's the pellet it's been designed around. So that's, it's even been, the gun's even been tuned to that pellet for velocity. Case in point, the average velocity with that 14.3 is 875 feet per second, which is the perfect magic place for a Diablo shaped pellet to live for 50 and 100 yard stability, okay? Filling it up to 3,000 pounds, running it down to 2,000 pounds of air, I got 59 regulated shots with an extreme spread of, I think it was 19 or 20 and a standard deviation of just 4.5. What that means to you guys is that you've got 60 or, so, 60 or so shots on a fill that will be good for 50 and 100 yard work. If you're gonna be in close at 25 or <laughs> 10 yards, <laughs> all right, then you can probably get a little bit more. This was running it out to 70 shots. And if you look at the tail end of the graph here, I dropped for that last 10 or 10 or 11 shots, I dropped about 15 feet per second, which is gonna really muck with my 50 and 100 yard when you add it to that 19 or 20, because then I'm up in that 30, 35, and you could start to see some point of impact change. So it's a 60 shot, 50 and 100 yard gun, and in close at 10 to 25, I would guess you're probably 70, 80 shots, maybe even more before you start seeing that point of impact, all right? Um, average velocity was 875 feet per second, as I shared. Uh, high was 885, low is 865. It pushed an 18 grain to 790, and it pushed a 16 grain to 840. So that kind of gives you the, it's 24 foot pound deal. On that note, I would have liked to seen more um, a, pre a competitive pre-charged pneumatic in 22 caliber today. When you look at the air gun industry as a whole, is running 30 to 40 foot pounds of energy. 24 is really on the low side of that. Um, I get why they did it because they wanted to make 215 cc's work for you, um, and get, still get you know 60, 70 good usable shots so that you can make good use of the gun. But, um, you know, I guess that's just how they wanted to do it. And, and I get it. It's all good. Just for what it's worth, um, that's not where kind of everybody else thinks a 22 should be. But that's cool. This is the most popular selling pre-charged pneumatic in the United States than it has been for over a decade. And Crossman is the largest air gun company in the world. So... They know what they're doing. I don't know what I'm talking about, but that was just my two, I probably don't know what I'm talking about, but I think I do. Um, but that's just my little two cents on it. All right, uh, trigger, lots to talk about with the trigger. So I'm gonna demo this for you. All right, so it's a dual stage trigger. It came to me with a first stage that was like maybe a millimeter and a half and then a second stage pull that was probably like, I mean, it felt like a mile, but if I were to measure it, measure it, it was probably half an inch, three eighths of an inch, something like that. Okay, and it broke at about two pounds. And I'm gonna say that again, it broke at about two pounds. And that's kind of a big deal. That's a testament to all the design and engineering that's gone into this semi-automatic because my experience 
with other semi-automatics, I did get my hands on one at one point and I did a full review of it. It's been a long time, but I want to say that trigger brake was like, like seven, eight, nine pound brake, something crazy like that, but it had a very different design. So it was very refreshing to see two out of the box in what they call a two stage, but it's not really a two stage because the second stage roll is so incredibly long before it goes off. Okay. What you're looking at here is me referring to the instructions in the owner's manual and, and getting that trigger adjustment more to my liking. Okay. There's basically, there's two trigger adjustment screws. There's one that kind of controls the overall weight of the pull. And then there's a, a much smaller one that kind of controls the, uh, the travel of that first second stage interface. And what I mean by that is, so for example, that, that smaller screw that controlled the travel of that first second stage interface, it came to me screwed about one and a half turns out from completely seated. All right. And what that made for is that little minuscule first stage that was like a millimeter and then like this half inch, like pull, 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 and then boom. And it went off by taking that first screw and lightly completely seating it. So about a hundred, about a hundred and a half, about a turn and a half clockwise, I was able to kind of shift that first second stage relationship to where the first stage was more like that. So very good, recognizable. Let me get in close here. First stage. All right, so it, it lengthened that by about a third, and it took about a third out of that long second stage pull before it broke. I liked it much better. All right, so here's what it looks like. Oop, don't knock over the pretty target. So here's what it looks like. First stage, nice hard stop. As you can see, it's very resettable. And then pull, 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 pull. And then it goes off. That's probably five eighths of an inch. All right, so it's probably more like three quarters of an inch before those adjustments. So also, you'll notice this trigger guard here. It's a polymer trigger guard. It has a trigger screw adjustment hole in it, but this is a pull from the Benjamin Marauder bolt action parts bin. So to adjust this trigger, you're gonna have to remove the screw, remove the screw, pull the guard off. Then you'll have access to those two trigger adjustment screws. Now the other one, the other trigger adjustment screw is right there. <laughs> So I was looking at the design. They show you a cutaway schematic in the magazine, and I'm looking at that design, and this is the one that kind of controls the overall pull weight. And, and it looked like if I just, and it's just a spring, you're compressing a spring on the entire mechanism, which just adds load to the pull. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, man, if I just remove that bolt and spring, it doesn't look like anything would fly apart, and maybe I can, you know, improve that, that, that trigger feel. And so I called Crossman and I'm like, Hey man, if I just, guys, if I just pull this, is it, is anything going to like fly apart in the trigger? Like, no, you can probably do it, man. Go ahead and try. So I removed it completely because I was unscrewing it, unscrewing it, unscrewing it. You go counterclockwise to reduce the pull weight. And I'm working that out like half a turn at a time. And I'm watching my two pounds come down to like, you know, one pound, 15 ounces, one pound, 14 ounces, one pound, 12 ounces, 1.8, 8, 8 ounces. That's when I'm like, that's when I picked up the phone and called Crossman. I wound up removing the thing all together and I got the brake weight down to a pound, guys. A pound semi-automatic. Now that is very exciting, all right? So, but let me throw kind of a wet blanket on all of that. From what I can see at 25 yards, this barrel, this in-house Crossman barrel, in this semi-automatic action, which semi-autos have an inherent reputation for diminishing accuracy. I don't, I'm not seeing that that's the case with this action in this barrel. So what I'm trying to say is this semi-automatic action and barrel combo are probably as true as you're going to find on any bolt action or side lever air gun. That's what I'm seeing at 25 yards. I'm seeing literally pellet on pellet repeatably. If I use my AEAC superpowers, in managing that trigger group, which is not easy to do because normally you've got that first stage, it comes up against the second stage stop. And then when I'm doing my precision work, how I pressure that second stage break has a lot to do with my repeatable accuracy when it comes to 50 and 100 yards. 
I don't have that crutch. I don't have, you're, you're just taking that, that control variable and you're throwing it out the window and you're doing your like, you're doing your pull, 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 pull. And you kind of get used to when it's going off, but still there's going to be some movement in there. There just is. And so it's a little bit of a guessing game. And if they could ever take the trigger group that's in the bolt action rotter and put it in this thing, you'd have boutique air gun brands that are, you know, they're guns that are in like the two and $3,000 price point peeing in their pants with what this is, this could offer for 700. But even then, you know, I, I still think this is going to get a lot of people super excited and, and talking to pyramid air. Um, they've been flying through these things that have been selling like Snickers bars. They get them in, they sell out, they get them in, they sell out. Crossman says they can't build them fast enough. So in, in getting on the forums, you guys are liking them. So, and I like it too. It's just be aware. It's going to take, you're going to have to bring your A game to, to make this trigger work with the level of performance that this action and this barrel is bringing to the table. All right. So let's decock this so that we're safe. Okay, good. And the safety is just a, it's nice. A little manual safety just swings forward, swings back. Now it looks like you can come off here. And you can, you can come off the safety and you can hit the trigger and you can move it back. But when this is cycled, it comes up against the stop. It must throw something in there and you can't cycle the trigger. Even it looks like you can come through here and, and, and do it. It's, it's not how it works internally. So it is a good manual safety. Okay. Um, accuracy. So I, run a ton, I ran a ton of product. I wanted to run everything. I wanted to try to make it mess up so that I could say to you guys, these pellets worked. These pellets wouldn't cycle and feed because everything in the firearms world with a semi-automatic, what will it eat? How does it cycle reliably? What will it feed? What is it accurate with with a semi-automatic? You know, I was trying to kind of go down that road with this because this is a whole new ball game. And to my disappointment, the damn thing ate every single thing I put through it after I, I buggered up that first magazine without like the singlest little bit of uh, a hiccup. And I ran 13 grain on up to 18-13. Uh, I kind of wanted to do the Barracudas, but being that it's just a 24 foot pound gun and it's taking a 14 grain and it's moving it to 875 and it's taking an 18 grain and moving it to like whatever the heck it was, seven, 790. If I were to put a 21 grain in there, it's probably gonna be pushing like 750 feet per second. And I'm gonna have like a two foot drop if between sighted in at 50 going out to 100 and the wind would be moving all those, all, it'd just be, it'd be, it wouldn't be good. So I just wanted to omit that all to, uh, all together. It just didn't make sense with the power level of this gun. So I ran it up to 18 grain. So I think I can get that to work. And, and it was flawless. So let me just run you through these. Crossman Premier domed, five at 25. I shot this group probably a dozen times over the week just to keep coming back to it. And it performed every single time. Now every once in a while, you know, these head diameters are not gonna be like what you're gonna see in a JSB. You know, these cost twice as much as this. So the consistency in the pellet isn't gonna be there. But for what you pay for these, this is going to be a great all-around go-to for this gun. And the barrel's been designed around it. So maybe I'll be surprised when I get out to 50 and 100 and those varying head sizes in here aren't going to matter a whole heck of a lot. But in my experience in the past, has taught me that they will. But that's with other manufacturers' air gun barrels. So we'll have to see. Funny, it didn't like the Crossman Premier hollow points. I tried them at 25 and it wasn't pretty. I always thought that that was the exact same pellet as this, just with a little bit of dye difference in the way the head, that little pocket was configured in the head, but I guess not, because it runs great with these things, All right? Um, the Range Master Sovereign Hunters, uh, 18 grain, did great at 25, fed them flawlessly, okay? Uh, same thing with, uh, with their 16 grain. You know, I tried the JSB and Air Arms variants of these two, which run different dyes at the JSB plant in the Czech Republic. By the way, if you haven't seen it, on my other YouTube channel, I've got a full factory tour of the JSB plant in the Czech Republic, as I do 
the H&N Sport plant in Germany. Check them out, super cool. But one of the questions I asked there that everyone's always asking about is with these pellet dies, you know, how this works. And for day state, they kind of have their own dies where they're running, running pellets to, uh, to their specs. Same thing with their arms and everyone else is kind of like on a, uh, a rotation. FX actually does similar where they have one die lot, do all their pellets for the year. So you get some really great consistency. But, um, you know, there's a little bit of a game to play there. I couldn't get it to like any of those other ones, but because of the barrel lottery and because of the pellet lottery, I would encourage you to experiment with all of it because you'll probably need to, and you'll find that it works, uh, works well with one of them. Speaking of that, it loved the Air Arms 18 grain. Got great consistency out of the rifle at, at, uh, at 25. And it did well. I wanted to put something really light through it to see if it would still cycle and feed. And I put a couple of lightweights through there. I put the 1343 JSBRS, plenty accurate. And I even ran these Predator GTOs and it was flinging these babies at 940 feet per second. This is a lead-free tin pellet. These are great if backdrop is a concern or if you want to limit range or if you're worried about toxicity because this is a pellet that loses energy very quickly and it's only 11.75 grains to begin with but it shoots fast and flat for that first probably 30, 40 yards. And because it's a little bit harder, the skirts on these um, come out of these tins like flawless. And so you wind up getting really, these GTOs are just great in everything I shoot them out of because they stay so darn uniform, but they're gonna bleed their steam quickly. They're gonna move around on you in the wind at 50 and 100 quite a bit. So just, just be ready for it. But uh, it did well with, uh, with both of them, okay? Naturally, um, having like the Crossman Premier domed Ultra Magnum 14.3, I think that's the technical full name. I wanted to run the Crossman's little copper plated guys through there. Now the copper plating literally takes this and it adds a copper plating. So you're decreasing your tolerance between the interface between the pellet and the barrel. It runs tighter. Some guns like that, sometimes guns they don't. Sometimes you can pick up accuracy. Sometimes it goes the other way. This gun fed these flawlessly and it was accurate with them. So if you've got some of these on hand, certainly, certainly try them. And then I ran all the H&N stuff through there. I wanted to find a couple of H&N nuggets. I found a couple, found the field target trophy, surprisingly in the 5.54 head size. It was funny, I put it up on Instagram and I got an email from, um, from Jorg over at H&N Sport in Germany. He's like, hey man, which of those field targets did so well out of the Marauder. This is very interesting. And when I told him the 5.54, he kind of gave me one of those. Oh, really? That's kind of a surprise, but hey, it worked. And the shape of this pellet and the size of this pellet is very similar to um, to the Crossman Premier Domed. So might have might have explained why it uh, like them. And it's like 14.66 grains. It's right there with those at 14.3. Okay. Now, it loved these Barracuda Hunters. These are like 19 grains. Um, and this is another one of the, those pellets like the GTOs or like a JSB or like a Barracuda variant that just seemed to run well in everything that I put them in. It was quite accurate at 25 yards, five on five. So if you're looking for a hard hitting 19 grain uh, hollow point that's probably going to give you a little bit extra, maybe another foot pound of energy because of the weight over the 13, over the 1430. It's a very good hollow point. The gun absolutely loved them. I know you want to know about slugs. Um, I did try the NSA 17 and a halfs. I didn't have any other slugs that were as light. Um, all my stuff from H&N, um, 25 grains, FX, 22 grains. Um, the new Daystate Howler slugs were you know, 20 and 22 grains. So I stayed away from, them. I didn't try them. But the funny thing was it actually fed the, the magazine and the semi-automatic action actually fed those 17 and a half Nielsen's perfectly. I didn't have a single hiccup and I ran about 20 shots five, or four groups just to make sure, but the grouping just wasn't there. So I'm guessing it, that slug just didn't agree with, you know, the, it's a choked barrel with the choked barrel. But we find a lot of choked barrels today performing incredibly well at 50 and 100 with, with all of these slugs that are coming out. So I don't know what the deal is there. Okay, so, um, oh, something I want to tell you about the stock. So I had mentioned that this is a Beechwood stock. 
and the synthetics are coming in a month or two, um, which is going to save you a pound and about 30 bucks if that interests you. But also, if you guys are unaware, Crossman has formed a partnership with Rexamex Crawl over in Turkey. So if you go to Crossman's website, you'll see they've got a bunch of new sexy guns on there. That's who they're in partnership to, you know, to build that brand here in the United States and, and you know, have a buddy in the industry. And in about a month or two, all of these Marauder Woodstocks are going to Turkish Walnut. And oh damn, I don't know if the price is going to stay the same at 730. I wouldn't expect it to because that's a lot nicer wood and it's probably going to be a little bit sexier of a stock. I would guess. I don't know. But looking at Crawler Rex Mexes, how they make their stocks to begin with, they're sharp, edgy, modernistic, stylish. You know, they look good. Hopefully some of that migrates over into uh, Old Faithful here and it sexies up our Marauder a little bit. All right, so speaking of sexing up Marauder, I wanted to spend a good amount of time talking about moderators because I still get a lot of questions on moderators and plus sizing them, okay? So that you can know what's going on here. These are the Donny FLs, that's the brand. Over here are, is the Zero DB brand. These are the probably the two most popular in the United States. These are the two companies that send me tons of these to play with on your guys' behalf so that you can learn about them and I can share with you what I learn. And so, um, and so here they are. The biggest takeaway is with the way that this action is designed, as I mentioned previously, with the moderators on, and as you can see, I tested all different shapes and sizes, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pellets. I said I got probably five or 600 rounds to the gun. Everything cycled and completely fed flawlessly without one single hiccup with all the moderators that you see here. That in and of itself is a, gonna be a huge deal for this gun because air gunners like to add moderators. Now that being said, you're 24 foot pounds and this is a very effective shroud and there is some kind of depinger in here. So the moderators, as far as I could tell here at 25 yards in a fenced in area, we're not making a huge difference when it comes to sound output. However, if I were to turn up this hammer spring or if I would go up to the 25 cal from the 22 cal, you know, increase the power one way or the other, more of this is gonna come into play. That's a part of it. Another part of it is I often use, and the pros often use moderators to tune a little bit more accuracy out of their air guns because these moderators have a tendency to stabilize the air behind the pellet so it flies truer without doing any of this. You guys have probably seen that now and then when something's off in, um, <clears throat> in the relationship between your pellet or slug and the barrel. And... Um, it really just helps stabilize that air behind behind the pellet. And also having a little bit of weight out here at the business end of the gun helps with flip. And I will tell you, this gun bucks around pretty good on the bench. And I don't think it's because of the 24 foot pounds. I think it's because of what's going on in the mechanism here in the gun with that, you know, the boom and the cycling, all the auto cycling where it's doing that work for you. Um, you, what you'll notice is you'll, you're lined up, you've got everything loaded up. This is not like a springer where you do the artillery hold. It's going to move all over the place. I got my best groups, you know, loading it up into the shoulder, loading it up with some downward pressure, loading it up, squeezing that grip vertically on both sides, and then just trying to let my finger kind of live in a world of its own and pull back, 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 back steady until, until the gun um, finally went off. But... Um, you know, that took, that took everything, you know, everything that I had to, to make that happen. But right at the break, I was getting move. Uh, I was getting movement. Either it would torque this way, it would torque this way, it would jump over this way, it would jump over this way. And I think a lot of that has to do with riding out that trigger blade to the end because you, you're not up against a hard interface and then it just rolls into a let off. You know, it's like I said, part of the, my accuracy success has always come from coming up against that second stage stop and that's my pivot point with my pressure. You know, 
perfect pad right in the middle of the finger, equidistant, everything else as it is around the gun. And that's how, that's one of the ways in which I'm able to get so much accuracy. At air guns at 50 and 100 yards, I do a lot of work to learn the gun there and make it work. But, um, <clears throat> But yeah, so that's uh, that's moderators. So you're probably one to two hundred dollar price point on moderators. Um, plus sizing. So this was kind of interesting. So with the Don FL Tatsu here, okay, I'll just show you. That's a two five Tatsu, and that's a two 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 Tatsu. And you'll notice the bore diameter openings; they're different size. The two two smaller. The game is the closer you, the smaller you can make that opening, the more sound deadening you'll have. But it's a game of diminishing returns. And what I mean by that is a 2.5 opening is going to be just barely marginally louder than a 2.2 opening. Um, but a 3.0 opening is going to be quite a bit louder than a 1.77 or 2.2 opening. So the game is to always try to run it as tight as you can without getting clipping. And now when I say clipping, by the way, guys, for those of you that follow me on Instagram, Hooked on Air, by the way, getting play-by-plays as I'm learning and putting up pictures and tech notes there for y'all, um, I'm, I'm always trying to run as tight as I can on that bore without getting clipping. And when I say clipping, I don't mean like the pellet actually struck something, like hit a baffle in here. It's very, very rare that I, I've, I've actually experienced that once or twice ever in five years where I actually broke something where I could see little mark, little lead markings up on the end. What normally happens is the pellet runs so close to it that the turbulence, it, it'll run so close to a baffle or the opening that the turbulence will destabilize the pellet. And that's where you're running into problems. Uh, that's where you'll start seeing it on the accuracy. So I'd run five shots with the 2-2 Tatsu. Tat, am I saying it right? Tatsu. Tatsu. <laughs> Five shots with the 2-2 two -two Tatsu, and I get four out of five, which are beautiful, and then one would just wander out a little bit. And that's not from a pellet strike in here. Like I said, it's you're getting a little too close where you're disrupting that flow, that airflow, and it just destabilizes that pellet. Moving to a 2-5 completely cured that, and I could tell no sound difference between the two on this gun. All right? Now, interestingly... Over here with the zero dBs, let me just grab a couple to kind of show you here. So whether I ran a 2.2 or a 2.5, 2.2 or 2.5, these are designated with stars. One star, one star on the front is 17722, two stars is 2225, three stars, I don't know, I think it's 30 and 357, something like that. But running the one star, which is the 2.2, gave me the same groups is running the two star, which is, excuse me, running the one star, which is the 17722, gave me the same groups as it did running the two star, which is the 22 or 25, yeah, 17722, 2530. Yeah, whatever. It's confusing kind of a little bit, but it's really not. So, I, and I don't know why that is. Um, the big takeaway is that all the moderators were doing well with the gun, which told me that the manufacturing process with Crossman, with the tolerances, is very good. The alignment in here was very good. When I first mounted this scope and set the scope to an uh, optical center and then threw it up on here and then started at 10 feet and then 20 feet and then 75 feet, my pellets on, on the vertical or on the left right vertical were all hitting dead center which means there's a lot of precision going into the manufacturing of the alignment between barrel and receiver. And then the bore that's drilled down the center of their barrel is aligned well as well. Like I honestly didn't expect that much precision. And so this gun loves moderators and it settled down and the extra weight settled, helped me with that, that torquing flip that I was getting managing the trigger and then all, you know, the movement that's going on inside, uh, inside the gun. Now, something else interesting, 0DB offers like this little diffuser. See how this one, see the difference between the two? This has like kind of a blast diffuser, which lets the air not just escape here, but it kind of comes out the sides, that it comes out the circumference of that opening. 
which helps move that air out in a way. It's like an air stripper. Again, so you're minimizing the turbulence that can destabilize the pressure, the pellet. And there, I wonder if I have an example here. This is pretty interesting. So perfect. So here's their one star. So their 17722 non-diffuser. See the size of that hole? Compared to their one star 17722 diffuser. See the size of that hole? That hole's a lot smaller, which tells me that um, that they're letting that air escape out of here so they can make that hole smaller and run tighter without you know worrying about destabilizing the uh, destabilizing the pellet. It worked great with both of them. But this was nice because it helped with that flip a little bit more than like anything else. So, you know, another way to do that is just to put a giant moderator on there. This guy's got them over here too. The Sumo and the Ronin and a couple other of these big bad boys. But anyway, um, that's kind of the game with moderators. Uh, Donnie FL <laughs> sells a little adapter, which kind of sits right over here. Just threads in. Uh, for cosmetics, he's got this little pretty guy on the end. And then off comes a little end here. And it's a one half inch UNF. And that's where your moderators are fixed to. All right. So make sure you get an adapter if you want to experiment with moderators. All right, scope. The gun, 10.2 pounds, wood. It's going to be 9.2-ish, shoot ready, synthetic. I want a really tiny scope to help offset some of that portliness. So sports match rings, little kind of their offset rings here because this particular, this is an Optisign CP, which stands for compact. It's a, it's a three to 10 fixed, or not a three to 10. It's a 32 by 10. Uh, yep, yeah, 10, 10 by 32. So it's a 10 magnification, 32 millimeter bell. Um, and it's really great for keeping the, keeping the weight down and keeping it all kind of back here where you want it to make the gun feel feel lighter. I wonder if you can cock it from here. That's an easy cock. That's actually, I'm just discovering this this instant on camera with you. This was awesome. That is a lot nicer than this. So going forward from my ownership experience, if I'm in the field and I need to charge that very first one, this is where I'm doing it. That was way, way easier. It took a lot less force so kids super senior people this is going to be the way to go so i'm just wondering if i can sh if this is going to show maybe it won't but so first stage take up no not bad but when you got lead in here and you're launching lead you get that little action you'll feel it you'll feel it on the bag you feel it torquing i wonder if there's a way to so let's see yeah, <laughs> you can even decock it from that new, new position. All right, uh, last thing I wanted to share with you guys, this is a little bit of a show and tell. This is an Action Armor Quadrant Target. And oh my God, everybody needs one of these. So air guns up here, so I, call, so I called AOA and I'm like, hey, I'm reviewing the Benjamin Marauder semi-automatic. I want to spice up the video a little bit with some air gun accoutrement so it's a little bit more interesting for you guys you learn i learn it's all good and i'm like what can you send me and they're like oh well we can send you our our new action armor quadrant target and i'm like okay so they send this thing i'm going to try not to sell a commercial here but i'm completely blown away with this thing and everybody needs one the reason this is such an incredibly good training tool is to own an air gun and to to master an air gun is to learn to shoot in the wind because air gun pellets move around like dandelion seeds in a hurricane. They just do. Only way to get, get around it is to get the power and the weight of the projectile way up, way up or shoot a slug. But especially with something like a 24 foot pound gun like this shooting a 14 grain, you're gonna need to learn to shoot in the wind at 50 and 100 yards because you're gonna be experiencing probably three to six inches of deflection in a four to five mile an hour crosswind. What's so cool about this target is it's got this little swingy guy in the middle, all right? So you're gonna know if you hit it, but you can see exactly where your pellets are landing 
without having to be respray painting this thing every five seconds or without shooting up a target at 50 and 100 yards and then shooting up a paper target at 50 and 100 yards and then going out there and replacing it every 20 shots because the thing looks like Swiss cheese. You can't see it anymore. This is an excellent device for learning to shoot in the wind because you can see exactly where, you, where you're hitting. And it doesn't matter if this is painted or not. At 50 and 100 yards, even at 10x, you're going to see these guys moving. So you can see exactly what the wind is doing. I love this thing even just shooting at 25 because, you know, I can run different pellets, see how they're grouping, see if I'm getting flyers with them just by the movement of the target. And it saved me all of that moving around, like marching up and down, resetting paper, and it do the same thing in a 50 and 100. And I, I was really kind of floored. So the funny thing is I took pictures of this and put it up on my Instagram, Hooked on Air. Man, I got a flood of comments of people being like, oh, my God, I got one of those things. It's the most amazing thing ever. And all these people being like, oh, my God, I totally have to get that. I mean, you totally have to get this thing. It's seriously, seriously cool. It's very portable. Just, um, you know, it comes out of here and, and you know, I'm a little embarrassed here, guns of air. It doesn't come with instructions. I don't know what the bleep this thing is for. At first I thought it was to put it in the back here and maybe hammer it down into the ground like a stake, but this doesn't fit in that hole, so it can't be for that. So I'm guessing maybe it just puts a little, you just kind of wedge it up on here and you boom, pressure on there and maybe it kind of helps keep this stable in the wind is my guess. But um, this thing is just so much fun. So I load up a magazine and I ripped off 10 rapid fire shots benched at 25 yards with the uh, Crosswind Premier domed. And it instantly blew all the orange paint off of this guy, <laughs> this little center guy. And the shrapnel from the lead blew some paint off of these targets. I only actually had one flyer in the 10 and you can see it on here. There it is, I think it's like right there. Everything else is just you know lead shrapnel flying all over the place, but it's about a hundred bucks. Just damn. The Optison CP 10 by 32, um, you're about 300 bucks here. Phenomenal scope. If you guys have seen me review their EVXs and their EVEs, um, I think on the um, <clears throat> Air Venturi Avenger video, I reviewed their 3 to, I think it was a 3 to 10, 3 to 12 CP. These compact scopes are amazing, guys. Great glass, great reticle. AO ranging is really good. It's always, almost always on with Optisons. I haven't had problems. And um, the, when you tell a turret to do something, your point of impact is doing what you tell it to. And that's important to, that's important to me. So I wanted to share that with you as well. That's what I'm running with. Um, I went through that kind of quick because these vlogs tend to get lengthy and I knew I had a lot to share with the Marauder. So I want to just slow down for a second. And make sure that I'm not forgetting to tell you anything. Foster fitting is right here. If you're brand new to air guns, you'll see this in the full review. This is where you refill. Um, I know I'm forgetting something. I guess I guess I would be remiss not to mention the brains behind the whole thing. John So Pietro. So Pietro. Sounds Italian. I should know that being an Italian, but I don't know if it is. But John Sopietro, he's the been like the lead engineer over at Crossman Corp for about five years now. And, you know, he's been the guy at the helm with a bunch of other people working hard with him, making um, <clears throat> making this work. And uh, it's 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 amazing, guys. I'm going to do this left hand. I'm not going to do this right handed. I can't do it fast enough left handed. <laughs> Not that you'd ever need to need it. So let, let's just talk about that for a second. So when the semi-automatic router came out, I, I, mean, I kind of thought to myself, well, that's kind of gimmicky. <laughs> Who the hell needs a semi-automatic router to go hunting for a squirrel or a rabbit? You know, or to be precise at 50 and 100, 100 yards. But as I, as, I, um, as I started to use the gun, I found that the value was not in that novelty. The value was being able to load the magazine, put it in there, cycle that charging handle, hit that forward assist. That one action is good for 10 rounds. And that's where, that's where I really 
started to appreciate the gun. It was a lot less work on me cycling the bolt every time. And it became laughably fun. Just sitting there when I'm doing all my culling with all of these different pellets at 25, trying to shrink a herd of pellets this big down to this so I know what to take with me to try at 50 and 100 and ultimately put on camera for you. I really appreciated that. It was just a lot less work. And I think that's going to be meaningful for, um, like I said, very senior, very young. And it's also going to be meaningful for, um, it's also going to be meaningful for like, you know, let's say you, you got that squirrel or whatever. You take that shot. You take your shot. Oh, no, you miss. Boom. You can take it right away again without having to do any of this jazz or any of this jazz, which makes the gun do this. So it's going to allow for very quick follow-up shots if for some reason you miss. I don't foresee that being an issue at 25, but once, like let's say, let's say I've got a bipod out here, right? And I'm, I'm prairie shooting the gun. I'm doing groundhogs at 100, 150, 75, whatever. That's where wind becomes huge and you can take that shot and you, you'll see that you went just left or right, or just over or just under, staying on target and watching, you take the shot and boom, you, you're right there again before that groundhog has popped down into that hole. So what I originally thought was a novelty, I think that this is gonna be a really good practical tool for air gunners, especially when you add that it cycled flawlessly after I boogered up that first magazine and was not pellet fussy and wound up liking a bunch of different pellets. So for 700 bones and it's hand pump friendly and it's regulated, I mean, they kind of got a home run here, guys. I mean, they just, they just do. They just do. I'd love to see it in a skeleton stock though. And maybe even a couple years down the road with a bottle on there. That would really fast forward it into 2021, but guys, I ain't complaining. So with that, if you're new here, you want to follow me every day and see what I'm doing every day as I'm working my way through the guns with pictures and tech notes, AAC Instagram is hooked on air. If you want factory direct industry press releases and more, my Facebook page is the Air Gun Exploration and Advancement Channel or AAC or hooked on air. You can look up any one of them and the two YouTube channels, AEAC Vlog and the big one, my primary, AEAC Home. And if you want to see what's in the bullpen and on deck for review, my website is aecaonline.com. I always have there what's inbound, what's arrived, the next three you're going to see for review. So, you know, there's a lot of good stuff coming. And, I'm, and I know a lot of you have been asking. I'm still working on my AEAC merchandising. Um, it's probably been nine months, but I actually trademarked and copywrote the Airgun Exploration and Advancement Channel, AEAC, the little roaring squirrel, you know, with the U.S. Patent Office, and that takes time. Um, I got a note probably two months ago that they received it. They had me pay my additional money to go ahead and push the, uh, push the, uh, the trademarks through, and now I'm just waiting. And as soon as that comes through, I'm going to... I'll have that merchandise for you that I've been working on. I'm thinking t-shirts, hoodies, backpacks, water bottles, just all the koozies, just all this fun stuff. So I haven't forgot about it. It's coming. I'm waiting on them before I take a, I've already taken a large amount of money and invested it in the trademark and copyright process before I take another large amount and start buying apparel, loading the website, aecaonline.com. Those are the things that I'm waiting for. So a couple of you have been asking and, uh, and thanks for your patience. So with that, Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I hope this video has found you well. And as I mentioned, weather permitting, in about two weeks, you should see the full review of the Benjamin Marauder Semi-Automatic 22 Cal over on my other YouTube channel, AEC Home. See you later, guys.